Okay, it is 2.45, so we can go ahead and get started. Move along here. Um, so welcome panelists. I see you're all starting to share your screens now, so I just wanted to go ahead and introduce everyone real quick. We do have Shirag Desai here. He's VP of Medical Products Division of WL Gore. Um, we have Cole Shearer on the screen, but unfortunately he had an emergency pop up, so he won't be joining our panel. Uh, but that's okay. So we, we have a great lineup of other people here. We also have Sarah DeVasher Wisdom, President and CEO of Greater Louisville Inc. Pernavir, President and Founder of VSoft Consulting. And then we've got Conrad back on screen, Chairman of the AI Innovation Consortium. So welcome everyone. We're glad to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you and Conrad will be helping kind of facilitate how the question gets answered and everything, but we do have five main questions we're going to pose to our panelists. That's kind of how it'll work. I can direct the first one and then we'll kind of take it from there and see, see what we can get out of you all today. So the first question we've got for you all, um, how do you see, how is your business or organization implementing AI? And I thought maybe Perna, if you wanted to kind of start it off on this one. Yeah. Thank you, Brianna. We at Vsoft, uh, we have been implementing AI for both our internal applications as well as for our clients that seek our help through our AI practice. So as a talent-driven organization, we reviewed our recruitment processes. Uh, we identified uh, the non-priority elements and routine but time-consuming transactional activities that could be potential targets for a more autom automated high-tech solutions. So we have been working on a chatbot that can generate the talent pools and also update the profiles of the talent uh, that exists in our, our database. And also we uh, use the chatbot to screen the first round applicants uh, and also send email campaigns to prospects. And then the chatbot also allows us to conduct the interviews, coordinate the interviews and schedule other logistics. So we have been working with various key stakeholders uh, to identify key talent processes within the organization. And we want to focus on areas where there is a high levels of high touch team involvement like identifying and redirecting silver medalist interviewees for other immediate openings, and also contacting and interacting with identified talent for critical hard to fill positions, and also doing some on-site interviews and extending offers. So wherever there is a possibility of automating these processes and gain the efficiencies we have been using uh, and, and transforming some of these manual processes. We also have several chatbots and um, you know, computer vision, vision solutions that we developed for our clients. So there's a lot of activity going on on AI side. Awesome, and then Conrad, if you kind of want to pick no, up the people, I don't want to. So thank you, Porter, for that. I, I, what I want to do is uh, maybe follow this with uh, Chirag and then have Sarah have the last word, given that she's kind of sits outside of the, uh, say, enterprise space and is more from the community and business development or helping business develop operational support for AI. Uh, so, Treg, I know your company uh, is a very large company, W. Lagore, and you're one of the IT heads there. Um, from the, the interactions I've had with W. Lagore, I've managed to capture some of the the core business aspects of what you guys do in terms of the fluoropolymer development and playing a lot in developing specialized components in healthcare. And I'm not quite sure because it's such a holistic umbrella in which you can apply AI. Where do you see AI uh, or how are you using AI today and where do you see AI being the most critical for you at WL Gore? Yeah, so Conrad, thank you for that. So I, as I, as a Brianna had mentioned, I'm a part of our, uh, one of our divisions. So we have a handful of divisions that we're broken up into. So I am I am with uh, the medical products division uh, within the umbrella of Gore, uh, the enterprise as a whole. And so we're, uh, you know, being new and we're monitoring the evolution and the maturation of that within the healthcare industry, specifically within medical devices. And so we use it in a couple of different facets. One, 
you know, that broad spectrum of where can AI help within devices itself. So if we're going to adjoin a device with uh, understanding signals, electrical signals throughout the body, what does that data tell us? What can we do? And what interventions can we do? And that's purely from a research academic perspective. What can it do us and how could we understand that better to improve patient lives, right? And so a lot of companies within the medical device space are looking at this and, and we're definitely reaching out and working with our researchers, engineers, academia around this, leveraging white papers uh, to understand what can that do in conjunction with our innovation center. But then we're also the, using it. Oops, sorry, Conrad, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say, do you find that uh, the, this sort of uh, exploratory work around AI and the deployments that you're working on, is it a easier path to develop these solutions internally or to uh, reach out to AI vendors? Or is it a mixed bag of those two that, that is kind of facilitating your path forward? Yeah, I think it depends on our, our purpose here. And so being a being an engineering company, being about science in in the white space, white space type of area, we're definitely reaching out and working with different vendors, right? So we're learning, we're absorbing, and definitely want to make sure that our products meet the needs of the patient, right? With a high degree of confidence. And how do we leverage this uh, if we even can, right? And where does the research take us? And so we're working with vendors to, to help us in that space. And so I was gonna follow up. So that's kind of one extreme. The other extreme that we're leveraging is we're starting to use uh, third party vendors and applications out there to really understand how can we apply AI in our supply chain? How can we leverage that within our operations? And so what does that do? And, and how do we become more efficient and optimize our processes helping our customers, you know, fulfill their needs, which ultimately being in the medical device space helps the, the physician or caregiver or the patient at the end of the day. And so we're, again, are we, we're doing a little bit of the mixed bag as you said, Conrad. So one, one extreme, we're working with vendors, academia researchers within the community. And on the other side, we're working with vendors and we're, we're looking at what AI, the algorithms, the data insights, what does that bring us? And how can we internally mature our processes, our skill set internally, then to take it to the next level? So we're just moving into this, I would say. And, and hopefully, as we deploy more, as we look into this, we're going to improve our own maturation around this. And then ultimately, again, hopefully that we evolve the industry and you know help the people that rely on us and our products. Conrad, did that answer your question? Did that help? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let, let me. Uh give Sarah the last word and, and rephrase the question here a little bit uh, since Sarah is the president of Greater Louisville Inc. And uh, the organization as a whole has a vested interest in the Greater Louisville companies and in the communities. So the question for you, Sarah, is how do you see AI helping communities, helping businesses within the Greater Louisville area? Uh, and how can you connect that to the efforts of, of GLI? Thank you, Conrad. That's an excellent question. As we have seen this pandemic continue, it's very clear that over 50% of the people that we work with are working from home. And that's within Louisville, that's also a national statistic. And we have seen AI really become very instrumental when it comes to identifying safe tasks. Um, AI has been very helpful to the healthcare community specifically in helping to increase management of supply chains and minimize unnecessary travel identify risk. We have really seen it a lot in the healthcare industry. I think it's really important for us all to embrace AI moving forward and really focus on all of the opportunities that it presents in career paths, in quality of life, in delivery of goods and services. So um, GLI has also noted that it's very difficult to implement AI mechanisms in the middle of a pandemic. So I think there was a lot of hesitation in the beginning before this to, to take on AI, to think that it's all robots or something. You know, everybody had so many questions if you didn't understand it. But now that we really understand it and have seen the benefits of it firsthand and how it can allow companies to really pivot, I think we're all seeing that it, we would have been smarter to implement more of these measures beforehand. And now going forward, I see a lot of companies beginning to do it more and more. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. I think right. we can go to the next question. Go ahead to the next question here. Um, I'll read it out loud. How do you or yeah, how do you see AI reducing red tape in government for business growth? I'm going to start with Sarah on this question because I, I think maybe she has some insights here, at least at the, uh, the state and city level. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll with just a little bit of work that we've been doing with state and federal organizations, uh, GLI being one of them, is that they've been very supportive of leveraging AI, right, and supporting of leveraging it for back to business, supportive of leveraging it for uh, workplace development and, and work skill development. And so, and I think that forward-looking individuals within organizations such as GLI, Sarah kind of articulated that earlier, uh, see that and, and want to be able to implement processes and, 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 and just disseminate information that can help businesses grow. So Sarah, maybe you can complement this question. Sure. You know, I really have noticed that AI is, I mean, it's a data function. And I'm sorry if I'm not saying that quite correctly. I mean, I'm sure you guys know the exact right words to use, but with humans, without AI, it's a human error component. So when the government realizes that they can rely on this data component, it feels safer. And so there is a greater um, desire to remove red tape because there isn't that human element for error things can still go wrong with data, but it's far more certain. And so there has been a lot more of um, a movement toward reducing red tape than uh, there would be otherwise. And in terms of business growth, it has really helped a lot of governments and businesses to make informed decisions. And again, it's relying on data as opposed to the human element. Um, healthcare organizations have relied on it a lot regarding critical shortages. It's given them um, the ability to estimate healthcare capacity. And I recently saw a statistic that 58% of large companies reported some form of AI implementation in 2019. And that's 11% up from the previous year. I think that that was all pre-pandemic as well. So it will be interesting to see what that statistic shows for 2020. Thank you. Uh, so Bruna, I know uh, Vsoft has I'm um, speaking about soft in the third person, but of course, I'm also a practice head there, uh, a automation lab and you know, automation in some sense here with respect to red tape is a, a critical mechanism to break those sort of barriers. And, and maybe you have some other relevant um, ways in which you feel that, that AI is reducing red tape in government. So maybe you can speak to this a little bit. Yeah, Conrad, I think uh, the, the first and foremost, uh, reducing the number of regulations, you know, this is something that many communities are doing in terms of uh, reducing regulations by eliminating the redundant regulations. So combining them, consolidating them is a starting point, uh, but also a lot of self-servicing by the citizens and also businesses so that the the delay in servicing the citizens and businesses will be uh, reduced. So using chatbots in a way that, you know, a lot of these things can be accomplished. Uh, like for example, you know, the USCIS recently implemented a chatbot where the chatbot guides the users to uh, solutions for some of the simple uh, questions that they may have or you know, uh, directing them to proper websites where they can get the information that they are looking for. Therefore, reducing the 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 line in which they are stay, standing. So that that's something that uh, can be applied across the board with other services that the government you know provides, both for citizens and also businesses. Right. I, I've I've heard uh, and we've seen a lot of evolution of. Uh, self-service activities that before were not possible because AI in the form of natural language processing and even computer vision was not as robust as it is today. So, you you know, that's why people, perfect example, and maybe tied back into some of the things Sarah is talking about, uh, go to the unemployment office instead of yes. filling information online because it's not intuitive to fill out information online. But if, if, but if you have an intuitive system like a chatbot platform, uh, maybe even a kiosk on site that has the ability to interact with the user and 
use computer vision, natural language processing, then those those mechanisms can be automated. Exactly. You'll have you'll have a friendly chat bot instead of a, an angry DMV person helping you. Yes. Well, let's uh, let's end this discussion with uh, with uh, Chirag, and, and I know that uh, first of all, I'm not familiar if you guys have a direct connection into the government, but maybe you have government customers uh, or otherwise just an opinion on how you see that uh, AI is reducing red tape in government and, and you can share that with us. Yeah, I, Conrad at a very high level and, and thank you for the question. I would say that knowing that this was out there, digital health being kind of a big term out there, med tech being a big term out there, and at least here within the US, so let me talk about the US for a sec. So we have to work very closely with the FDA, right? And so all of our products have to get FDA approval. Now, one of the things the former uh, FDA uh, commissioner did was, or, or the FDA as a whole and, and the people there, they put together some guide rails. And so they did start putting out a document that said, here's how we put a framework together to work within uh, implementing AI. And so I think it was in mid part of, of last year, April, 2019, they started reaching out to the industry as they normally do on, on topics like this. They put a framework out there, they're soliciting input. And so that's really helping us, you know, Gore as a whole to work with the FDA, kind of put those guide rails in, but the industry as a whole, and how do we start bringing AI to the forefront into digital health or med tech or, or just our products as a whole. So it's really helping to start that conversation and then lead it forward as well. So I, I think that really helps in this particular case, we're having the government put some guide rails that we as an industry or a player within this industry can kind of navigate around and, and work through and help evolve. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll move us on to the next question. Uh, what is the biggest challenge for businesses adopting AI? I will start now with, with Chirag as we ended with him. Mm -hmm. And I'll just build off of that and I'll share a little bit on what we've seen also in, in the consortium space. But Trey, if you can take this away, I think obviously you've kind of shared what you've been doing already. So what do you find to be uh, the biggest challenge for driving this adoption internally within uh, WL Agora? Yeah, I would say, you know, we're learning about AI. What does it mean to our business and, and ultimately how does it help our, our customers and, and the patients that we serve? And so it's new, it's new within our industry. We need to learn about it. We need to mature our capabilities around it. As we're working with people within the community, the researchers, the academia, patients, our, our customers, hospital systems, what does the data provide? How does it provide that insight? And then what's the outcomes and the evidence that shows that it will prove what we're looking to do? And so we have to take that all into account. And there's, there's obviously a journey and a process to get there. And so those are some of the challenges on a macro level, uh, how do we get the data? Because we're talking about patients, right? In cases, if it's supply chain related, still IP, confidential in nature. Uh, what do we do with the data? Who owns it? What do those insights look like? And so I think we're also trying to work our way through as the rest of the industry. What does that mean to us? Who owns it? What do we do with it? And how do we navigate within this regulatory environment that we operate in? Data sounds like an underlying theme here. Uh, I know maybe you didn't have a chance uh, to be on earlier, but that is something that we've heard through various sessions as an underlining foundation for successful AI deployment and a, and a gap, whether it be just consolidating information in, in, a, in a relevant repository, collecting the, the information, having the information be accurate. Um, so all those things, I think, holistically apply to all businesses and you're kind of resonating that here. So interesting point. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll lead in now with, uh, with Purna uh, in terms of the biggest challenge of adopting AI. And, and Purna, I, I don't know if you have some specific ideas here, but I also wanted to touch upon, because you're a successful entrepreneur across different industries, uh, IT being you know, the one that we're seeing here today, uh, I wonder if you can give us a flavor both within vSoft and maybe outside of vSoft uh, as how, what you see to be a challenge in adopting AI. And you can pick any one of the other um, industries that uh, connects with you. Thank you, Conrad. I, I think yeah, our conversations with C-level uh, stakeholders at different companies, you know, from vSoft in terms of a consulting firm, trying to help different sectors, 
we see the pattern and you know there are so many um, uh, like hurdles to adopting ai uh, but there is a, a pattern like the top four that i can think of is like lack of a clear strategy of ai and then what's the roi expected from that and and especially with you know the the maturity of their center of excellence within their company um, so the earlier small failures are seen as a end of the road and then move on uh, so that's something that seems to be the the trend that we have been seeing but more and more the the companies are seeing the the successes outside and then reeling back into and trying to adapt ai in, in their organizations and also the the lack of quality data in some cases uh, derails their efforts in adopting ai and uh, the third that i can think of is a lack of talent of course i mean that's across the board we see in many cities and many communities that's being the problem um so with appropriate skills to uh, implement ai work and again uh, within the organizations there are so many functional silos that constrain end to end ai solutions uh, within the organization right i think uh, recently i read a report somewhere that there's a uh, a gap in data science expertise that's up in the hundreds of thousands of positions that because there is insufficient expertise in, in particular AI fields. So uh, absolutely a relevant challenge, right? Yes. Uh, Sarah, I'm gonna load your question a little bit because I believe for you to have the, the largest and most holistic pulse in terms of community connection. Um, and, and a lot of the things that you hear around the kind of barriers to adoptions of AI within as, as they're perceived by communities is biased and is kind of that that notion of the dark AI. So can you share with us a little bit, and maybe I, I loaded the question too much, if you wanna to speak to some other point, that's fine. But can you share us a little bit about that perspective and, and what you're hearing and, and maybe how that could be addressed through organizations such, such as GLI? Sure. I would say that what I hear most is just a lack of knowledge of how to move forward. So there is still that, that dark AI component out there, but I don't hear that as much as I used to, because I think that even in the past six months, so much more is known about it. There has become a realization that we've got to adopt this or we will be left behind. Um, and like I said, I would not have said that six months ago, but the bigger question now is the how, and that's what I hear companies asking the most. And so it's wonderful that they have a company right here in Louisville that they can go to and get that consulting from. Um, probably multiple companies, but my boss, our, our uh, GLI executive committee member, Perna Veer, I gotta give him a shout out for that consulting work that Vsoft is always doing. So appreciate that. And that is what I hear most often. Just what do I do? Where do I go? How do I do this? Okay, great. All right, and then just for time's sake, I'm going to skip over to this last question here. Uh, what will business look like in five years with the power of AI? I get a sense that we have the same five-year theme going through all the obviously. <laughs> maybe. Uh, you know, if maybe I'll, I'll start with this one just to give you my input, and then we can lead backwards again. So I think, you know, you've seen throughout the sessions different vertical markets that have a, maybe a different a level of aggression in terms of their, their adoption rates of artificial intelligence for different reasons, either because they have a lot of work to do on the, on the data end or on the infrastructure end to be able to actually deploy AI. And then you have other organizations that are leading uh, with very sophisticated computer vision system, very sophisticated analytics platforms that can get insights around data in the finance industry. Um, so it will look as always, this question is answered different depending on uh, what industry you look at. But I believe that one thing you're seeing, right, Sarah mentioned it, the, the, the acceptance levels are, are, are growing. Uh, second is the need is growing. Uh, uh, and also the, the, the accessibility to tooling, the cost effectiveness of these solutions, the robustness of their capability is growing. So I believe, you know, within the smart man within the manufacturing world, you're going to have a lot of growth in in automating tasks in in the 
um, smart city world, you're going to have a lot more deployments, leveraging computer vision, levering, leveraging autonomous vehicle, uh, delivery and autonom autonomous vehicle usage. So depending on the market, again, a lot of different evolutions. Uh, and of course, if you are someone in the audience looking to get a deeper insight, you know, sure more, but uh, I'll, I'll then lead this off to Sarah. Um, and, and maybe Sarah, you can share with me a little bit more from GLI's perspective and from the greater Louisville area's perspective, what is happening in, in the area right now, you know, outside of this great event uh, that is, is kind of helping the greater Louisville take shape around artificial intelligence in the next five years? Glad you asked that question. In my opinion, our community will look like what we want it to look like in five years. And so therefore we have to do a lot of groundwork to get it there. We have to take an intentional focus on technology. In 2019, GLI named it the, the year of technology. And in doing so, we tried to bring awareness to the necessity of tech, the importance of tech and aligning our workforce pipelines with tech. And then in that same year, Microsoft announced the new regional AI hub in Louisville. Completely coincidental, but very exciting. So now we have decided to form a technology network that I believe John Lonis spoke about in one of your opening sessions. And so we have consulted with about 15 of the technology companies in our region. We have almost 2,000 tech companies in our region based on a study that we did a couple of years ago, right before 2019, when we named it the Year of Tech. So that network will focus on a few key things, and the strategic vision is basically building out that tech cluster. It will include things like developing a culture that is innovative and inclusive, um, focusing on creating several innovation hubs that are thriving, but most of all, making our region a location of choice for tech-enabled companies. That's what we're gonna focus on. We're gonna do that in a variety of ways. That includes uh, working through the media to put ourselves on the map for tech. So in my mind, this is how we get to where we want to be, and that's a thriving tech hub. Let's focus on creating that network, making it strong, and making our region that location of choice for tech companies. Thank you, Sarah. Bruno, maybe you can complement this from the eye of, of uh, a company also in Louisville, but an international company. And where do you see um, our I think AI companies? will transform the businesses by reducing the costs, uh, managing risks, and streamlining the operations. And, and uh, in a way that we, we have learned all the lessons that we need to learn by now, I think this is the, the AI, AI adoption is going to take off. And uh, particularly, I, I see that three functional areas where I see a lot of growth uh, in terms of AI, ROI from the AI projects. Uh, that will be sales organizations and, and marketing teams and also customer service uh, with all the projects that we have seen and what we are, what we are seeing in the pipeline. I think there will be a huge transformation in those areas. Mm -hmm. uh, Shirag, we're going to save you for last here if you can share with us your perspective um, and feel free to adjust that timeline maybe, think 10 years in the future, 15, to get creative. Where, where do you see AI 15 years from now uh, within WL Gore? Yeah, so maybe uh, it, it definitely in WL Gore, I think we'll see more and more of AI and I think that's because just the industry as a whole is, is moving there, right? So if I, if I give you my opinion on AI as a whole, right, just five years ago, you guys have five up on the slide here. Five years ago, this market for around AI was what I've seen numbers in research papers, white papers around 500 million, $800 million. You're looking at 2020, 2021, I'm seeing research papers talk about an industry on a global basis of seven, eight, nine billion dollars. That's a huge trajectory, right? That's exponential in terms of what we're looking to do. And so I think that in itself will, in my mind, and, and we're seeing it already in manufacturing, we're seeing it in smart cities, we're seeing a commercialized market, right? A little bit more in front of us. And so if we do start seeing that awareness, that education, the adoption, the innovation that happens, then I think AI looks to be a very bright future. Now, 
we talked about the dark side of it a, a little bit, but there's a lot of positives related to it. And, and we're seeing the industry and the community kind of get their hands around this. And I think it'll be something that we as WL Gore and anyone in this industry has to take a, a clean look at and say, how does it help us improve what we're looking to do and, and the people that we serve? Absolutely. All right, and we are actually just out of time now. Unfortunately, we didn't get to the Q&A portion. There was a couple questions that came in, but like I've mentioned throughout the day, any questions that don't get answered, we are keeping track of them on our end, so we'll be sure to get them handed out to you in a post email or other form. You will see answers to these questions. So I just wanted to say quickly, thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time today. I know all of you have busy schedules out there, so we just wanna let you get back on with your day. Um, so thank you everyone. <laughs> Final remarks, you can go ahead and say them now. Otherwise, we are good to go. No, thank you all, uh, Sarah, Purna, Jurag, for your time here. And uh, we welcome future collaboration with all of you as part of the AI Innovation Consortium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you all. Thank you.